Well, a good day for me begins by looking who died. Um, <laughs> in, in the morning, I wake up and I see um, online now mostly, but not only, who, who died. And if a lot of people that I respect or people that I'm learning to discover through the obituary have died, I consider it a good day. Um, it sounds vaguely perverse, but we will find out that perhaps it isn't and that many people here in this audience share that pa passion. The, um, uh, the editor of the obits page at the Washington Post was arguing this and saying people were, you know, looking down their nose at him from the national desk and he said, they're covering the dog at the White House and I'm bearing an era. <laughs> Yeah. Also in the introduction uh, to the book of obituaries that has just come out, you mentioned that The Economist now considers the obituary pages among the liveliest. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that for many, many years, The Economist didn't go near obituaries. 150 years. 150 years. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of live, 150 yes. times 52. That's 7,500 people they didn't that cover. That we missed, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of catching up. There's a lot of catching up. What, I, what I'd like to fix on is your idea of the straight line. I think it's interesting that if you would take a life from birth to death and just follow it straight through in chronological order, which some obituaries still do, I, I think that is not the way to capture a life at all. I, I think you do have to home in on certain points in it. There'll be one or two incidents that will really illuminate the whole thing. I think it was Virginia Woolf who said that it might be possible to write a whole life out of one tiny incident, maybe even just two minutes. And, and I think that might be true. There is going to be some moment in a life that will suddenly make sense of the whole thing. And you could extrapolate from that to bring in other elements in the life. I mean, I, I feel that it's important to get away from chronology. Get away from chronology, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. you, yes, what? absolutely. The dreadful chronology, which drags down the, the marching facts, which weigh down so many obituaries. And, and they're an important part of it. They're an important part of it, uh, not only for the people's family, for the genealogical, uh, for the genealogical people who follow, and for the historic record, but in terms of a read, in terms of a narrative, uh, they really get in the way. And there are some newspapers that have figured out how to... The life gets in the way, but I'm saying. <laughs> the, facts no, the facts of the facts life, the, the train, <laughs> yes. The all facts are not the life. <laughs> you, know, the, yeah. the, you know, the awards, the, uh, you know, the years that they graduated from this place or that place. Um, you know, those are things that you have to get through in order to get to the stories and get the sense of the breathing, living person. And that's what you're trying to do. You're really trying to bring someone back to life. And if you don't get it, that sense when you finish an obituary of, I know what the essence of that person was, if it's not breathing, then it has failed in some sense. I won't read this entire obituary, uh, but uh, it's, I think, a model. It was written by Bob McFadden, the great, great uh, rewrite man at the, at, uh, at, at the Times. Uh, about a man named Amory Bradford, who happened to be the general manager of the Times. He, he worked at the Times for many years. Um, I will skip through and then get to the, to the key point. With that name, he was the, the, the uh, direct descendant of the second governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, he was uh, uh, Andover, Yale, Yale Law School, uh, Army Intelligence. Then he went to work at the Times, and he was picked by the Times, by the newspaper publishers, to be uh, their spokesman and their negotiator during the great newspaper strike that I was speaking about before. Uh, it, it talks about how, to get a sense of him, the Publishers Association chose Mr. Bradford as its point man in negotiations with Typographical Union Number no. 6 and its president, Bertram A. Powers. They were natural enemies from the start. Mr. Powers, a high school dropout, was a tough, relentless negotiator, the embodiment of a gut fighter up from the streets. Mr. Bradford, an Ivy League aristocrat, impeccably dressed and six feet four inches tall, was accustomed to snapping orders at pliant subordinates. One top-level mediator said Mr. Bradford brought an attitude of such icy disdain into the conference rooms that the mediator often felt he ought to ask the hotel to send up more heat. <laughs> um, then, so he, he done, his career crashes after that at the Times, and he leaves, and he, he's a consultant to the Ford Foundation. He's an executive at the Scripps Howard newspapers. He, 
has a job at the Commerce Department. He's one of the people in the early years of the Nixon administration who set up the Environmental Protection Agency. And then we learn, in later years, Mr. Bradford acknowledged having become a jobless alcoholic, but he began psychiatric treatment, quit drinking, and radically changed his lifestyle. He began studying massage and psychotherapy <laughs> at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> the last time he attended a reunion in the Thousand Islands with his fellow Yale Skull and Bones members, one remembered Amory lounging in the nude while they sat on the beach in their trunks. In fact, he went nude for most of the day. From 1978 to 1982, Mr. Bradford lived in a van, traveling in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, occasionally revisiting Esalen. He practiced gestalt therapy, and he and his wife, Lorene, also taught massage. In recent years, he had been writing his memoirs. In a statement he composed for his own obituary, he said that his, quote, final years were intensified by the practice of Siddha Yoga meditation taught by Swami Muktananda, to whom he had been introduced by his daughter. Uh, now, wow, no, second yeah, act. Yeah. Uh, I think we care about life, and I think we care about... Um, and we care about being surprised. I mean, it's the same news over and over again, really. It's very hard to get surprised. On the front page, on the front section, in the metro section, I would say um, eight days out of 10, you can find a nugget on the obituary page that will carry you through half a dinner party. <laughs> I mean, there's like all kinds of crazy things. <laughs> Does it help if somebody dies earlier in your issue week? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's a, that's Monday, awesome. Tuesday, yeah. yeah. Tuesday's a good time I to die. Pray. Yeah. I pray. I pray. <laughs> it's true. It's I very, don't want very anyone important. to die on Wednesday. I mean, I have to keep the Grim Reaper at you bay. Know, in, in the world of sports, don't win the championship on Tuesday because Sports Illustrated goes to press on Monday. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the same it's thing. Yeah. This has been so interesting, and I, I think my favorite part was about these tiny formative moments that can presage a life or illuminate a life. And I was wondering, and forgive me, it might not be the kind of question that you can consider while the bright lights are on you, but I didn't know if any of the four of you, including Paul, would had an awareness of what such a moment would be for you. <laughs> the light is awfully bright. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. but you can hmm. I will well, say um, one of my f one of my favorite obits uh, from the Daily Telegraph ended with the with the um, uh, with the line he detested ratatouille and pesto <laughs> <laughs> and That's and great. somehow you know it it, it, it it turned out, the editor told me, it was just one of the little facts that they had accumulated that was left over <laughs> at the end, and they just stuck it at the end, but it gave everything this, like... Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't top I think, that. Yeah. <laughs>